comparison is the thief of joy. So if you're constantly worried about comparing yourself to what the next person is doing next to you, you're never going to fully recognize and acknowledge your own growth and your own process within that. So and just be you, be 100% you genuinely, and it's okay if your movement doesn't look like anybody else. Be great in what you do, and somebody will value it and pay you for it if that's what you want. <laughs> Hey, all right, so I am now on the line with a Mr. Emmanuel Manny Chacon, who yeah. is a dancer, a choreographer, as well as a Capoeira instructor. You were born and raised in Wilmington, Delaware. Is that correct? Yep, yep. Hey, hey, best, hey, you best city ever. Best city in the world. <laughs> <laughs> show up, bro. Show up, man. Probably, probably one of the smallest cities in the world. <laughs> Definitely, I understand that, but I'm going to ask you, I've never been to Delaware, man. I will say that. Uh, I mean, we're coming up. We want to come up. Okay, so I, I think that's a that's a I think that's a great way to start this out, man. I would be very interested to hear from you, man. Please tell me what was your childhood like growing up in Delaware? Yeah, so it's uh I had I have like this conversation a lot just with all my experience and my travels within dance. Uh now that I think about it, I don't know if I've ever come across anybody else from Delaware, like and all my experiences of performing. Um, Cause even when I was with the dance company, Step Africa, we would do introductions at the end of the show. So everyone would be like, and such and such from Philadelphia and such and such from Los Angeles, from Washington DC, from New York city. And then, and from Wilmington, Delaware. So, <laughs> um, but it, I mean, Delaware is a small state altogether. Um, Wilmington, Delaware, we only have three counties, and I'm in the northern county, which is Newcastle County, but what I like about my city and where I am, I'm in the middle of a lot of other major cities, so as much as other friends try to convince me to move to bigger cities, they're like, why do you stay in Delaware, why do you want to be there, and I'm like, well, one, it's home, but like Philly's right there, Philly's not even an hour away, like depending on what part of Philly I can get there and anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. Like if I want to catch a Sixers game, which is my favorite basketball team, I can get there in 35 minutes. Um, Baltimore is about an hour away. DC is within two hours. Jersey's right there. New York City is anywhere between two, two and a half hours. So I feel like I'm just in the middle of all these other places that I can easily get to. The airport's not far. If I want to fly out of Philly, I want to fly out of Baltimore. So I just feel like I have access to so many things. But in Wilmington, Northern Delaware and Southern Delaware are very different in terms of Southern Delaware. It'll feel a little more country, a lot more farmland, um, a lot, a lot more land. And then Wilmington is kind of more like the city environment. Uh, so growing up, I grew up in the in the city of Wilmington, in the inner city. And the inner city is broken up into four different parts. So you have West Side, North Side, East Side, and South Bridge, and then majority of the Latinos. If you meet a Latino and they're like, oh, I grew up in, in Wilmington, nine times out of 10, they're from West Side. So, so, that, that, so that, was the, that was my upbringing. Like it's now we moved out of that environment when I got to high school, because the area was getting, it's, it's a rough area. Um, and at that point in time, when we moved to where we are now, which is like 10 minutes out, but a more suburban part, um, it was getting a little crazier on my block specifically. And as I was getting to high school, my parents were like, you know what, it's it's time to get out of here. I, I got to let me interrupt you real quick, man, because I got to ask you, Um, I don't know anything about Delaware and I've never heard of, uh, you know, gangsters in Delaware. So what do you mean by it was getting crazy? <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so. The thing is, I get that a lot. Like, even people are like, what? I didn't even know there were Latinos in Wilmington. Like, how do y'all have this city environment? How do y'all have bodegas and all this and that? So 
it's literally like the, the best way to describe it is as I've taken my friends through my hometown, like on my childhood street and around my childhood home and the community center I grew up in when I drive around the city. The what I always hear constantly is people say this looks like a mix of Philly and Baltimore. At least that's what I because you know it's we have city blocks, row homes, the corner store. Like honestly, I think you know I would I would imagine just like any city block in a way. Um, it's just like that. So I mean, it was getting it was starting to get rough because there is the crime rate is a little violent. Um, I'm trying to think at that point in time, you start seeing the presence of gangs nowadays. I haven't seen it or heard of it as much as probably I did before. Um, it can, you still get some things of violence in certain pockets, I would say, because gentrification is real. And although it hasn't made its way directly into where I grew up, you can see it slowly creeping in in the distance. So who knows what it'll look like in the next 10, 15 years. Um, but yeah, like in, I would say, so we moved from that house in between my transition from eighth grade to ninth grade. And that last year, like that eighth grade year, it was, there were like multiple like shootouts on that block. Like there were, there were times where I could wake up and go to the bus stop in the morning, like that eighth grade year. And you would see shells like on the corner right there. And it's kind of sad because as a kid, looking back at it, you would think as a kid, anybody would be like, oh my gosh. But you become so desensitized to it in that environment. And I feel like that's kind of sad, like now thinking back. And I'm like, as as a teenager or anything, trying to go to school, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a norm or you shouldn't hop on the school bus to go to school and be like, oh yeah, this morning, guess what I saw? Like, so... That's why I, I try my best to represent Delaware and not even just Delaware, like anybody that has some connection to if if I can look like you, if if you can see me and you hear me and you see me dance and you feel some relation connection or you can see yourself within that and you see me representing you in a positive way because we're so we're stereotyped so much in a negative way. It's almost like you just want to redefine that stereotype. I'm curious, man, where are, where are your parents from, may I ask? Yeah, so my mother was born in Puerto Rico, and my father was born in Guatemala. and But they met in Chicago. So that's where my older brother and sister were born. So I'm the youngest of three. So my older siblings were born in Chicago. And then later on, I moved to Delaware. And then, boom, I was the gift. Do you do you know what brought them to Delaware of all places? Yeah, so the funny thing is, uh, I already had family here in Delaware, so I always asked my mom what made her go to Chicago before Delaware, because we already had family here. So the way the the Latino community in West Side has grown, like a fun fact is, one of my mom's older siblings. So my mom is actually the youngest of sixteen. So my so my grandfather, his first wife passed away. And then when he married my grandmother, that's when he had more kids, of course. <laughs> but I feel like in that point in time, it's kind of normal to have a lot of kids because, you know, it's a lot of uh, farm living. So it's like you almost like need all the kids to work the farm. But uh, one of her older brothers moved to to Wilmington like in the 40s. And they were among the first Puerto Ricans and Latinos in the area. Because that area back then in the day was predominantly Italian and Polish. Like you still see some of the buildings with Polish names and Little Italy is still there. Um, but at that time, they were among that first wave and first group of like Latinos. Because now the whole area is Latino. Um, but I always ask, what, why Chicago first? And my mom just said she went with a friend. She one of her best friends in Puerto Rico was like, I'm going to Chicago, going to the mainland. And she just went. And then the same thing with uh with my dad. I think they already knew some people there. Um, 
his story is different because it's not as easy to get into the states from Guatemala as it is Puerto Rico because my mom had her citizenship, of course. Um, but yeah, so he just ended up ended up there. My dad's side of the family is very dispersed. Like my mom's side, it's either they're in Puerto Rico or they're around here, somewhere like between Pennsylvania and and Delaware and like Jersey. But my dad's side, I think. I almost feel like everybody kind of just went where they could get it. <laughs> like I have an uncle that ended up in Canada. I have an uncle that's in Miami. I have an aunt that's in Seattle. I have family in LA. Um, and then those that are still in Guatemala and in Chicago, of course. So it's a little dispersed. Okay. I understand that, bro. You, um, you know, you kind of spoke, you know, you said, Delaware was getting kind of crazy, man. And you told me beforehand that, you know, at an early age, you got into Capoeira. I'm very curious, um, you know, I guess what initially got you into that? How did you, you know, start doing that? Yeah, so Capoeira was mainly through my older brother. So he was doing it for a while before me. So the age difference between my sister, like my brother's 15 years older than me and my sister's 12 years older than me. So there's a big age gap. But um, he started first and he like grew up playing Tekken and remembering the movie Only the Strong. That's like from the late 80s, early 90s. I remember so, Tekken, they had that dude, what was his name? Eddie. He did the yeah, cap wetter, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah so so uh, my brother he always remember that. And then that's how I always say it when people are like, oh, what's that? And I'm like, you ever played Tekken? You know, Eddie Gordo? Then like, oh, okay. Um, but for me, I I wanted to start some type of martial art or some movement as a kid. We didn't have much here in Wilmington, like in terms of studios or things. And then the Capoeira school finally opened and that's when my brother joined. Um, originally, I was going to start boxing at that point in time. I was like, I want to do something. Um, and if you're Puerto Rican in this area, you were either boxing or doing baseball. So I was like, I want, I want to start boxing. Um, and then my brother was like, that same summer, that's when I had intentions of starting boxing. And that same summer, my brother was like, oh, you should come to a capoeira class with me. I think you'll like it. So I finally went and literally I went my first class and then just kept going. Like I just I just fell in love with it from the jump. Like it was I just loved the movement. I loved the intensity of it. Um the instructor very early on, like my instructor that started me, uh was very like I see as an old school approach and I'm thankful for it as much as people would say, like, yo, that was death. Like, why was it so crazy? Why was it so intense? But it has helped me a lot throughout my career, like anything with physical activity, because at a young age, I became accustomed to something so intense. And even I've had to learn when I've taught classes, it was a learning process because in the very beginning, I think I was uh, I was hurting people a little too much. I was being a little too intense. But to me, that became a norm because very early on, Capoe, the classes were three hours. It was so much, con- so it would be like the first hours like conditioning. So we're just around this gym, sweating, running, jumping, throwing up <laughs> so, and then the second hour we we're doing movements and then that last hour we would probably focus more so on the game of capoeira and, and the musical elements that's amazing bro that's that's super amazing man so see you you know you're growing up doing capoeira man um you know i guess i'm, I'm very curious to hear from you man tell me you kind of spoke on already man but Tell me about your beginner stage in Capoeira, man. You know, what was that like for you? Yeah, so because the school was so new here in Delaware, uh, I was the youngest in the group. So there was like no kids or teen class at the time. So I was just thrown in right with the adults. So I think my experience was unique in the fact that from the jump, I'm it's just all these adults like in their careers, like 20s, 30s, 40s, and they're just... And then you got me. I'm like 14 at the time. Um, But I enjoyed, like I said, I enjoyed the intensity of it. Um, It definitely helped me a lot. It just 
for all the energy I had, it gave me something to like channel my energy to. Um, definitely helped a lot with, I guess, confidence as well as I was going into high school. Um, and because I was training so much and the classes were so long, I feel like I was able to learn certain things very quickly. So even like when I was two months into Capoeira, people were like, oh, I thought you've been doing this for like six months. And then once I hit the six month mark, people were like, oh, I thought you were doing this for like one or two years. And then when I hit the one year mark, people were like, oh, I thought you've been doing this. So I'm very thankful for the intensity of it. Like I said, those, that fir those first few months, there were moments where I thought I was like going to throw up and you start feeling like, oh, it's coming up, it's coming up. But eventually your body becomes used to it. Um, and yeah, once I got to high school, uh, I never had issues with anybody. I think my, my sophomore year of high school, I, I became brave enough and I felt I was skilled enough to showcase it. So junior, uh, sophomore, junior, and senior year of high school, I always performed in our variety show or talent show. Um, and that started becoming like a, a thing that everyone looked forward to in a way. And, uh, but once people found out I could do capoeira or saw my movement on the stage, nobody <laughs> tried to mess with me. So I guess that's a plus. Nobody tried anything in high school. Let me ask you this. I'm very curious to hear, man. Um, do you think that capoeira is... I don't know if this is the right word, but is it a practical form of self-defense? Yeah, yeah. So I, that's, that's a great question. Um, because, because it's disguised within dance, because of the, its history and nature, a lot of times people will question, oh, is it? But that's why I'm thankful for the way my instructor trained us, because you can see it. Some, some places may focus more so on the art, than the martial, if that makes sense. And to me, whenever I teach capoeira or when I train, I always want the class, like, I want you to see it and be, my approach to capoeira is if you see me doing capoeira, I want you to think, wow, that looks so nice and graceful, but I do not want to get in the way of his kick. Like, I want you to be like, yeah, he looks so smooth and he makes it look easy, but it looks so strong. So, uh, I mean, it it is, it is. Like, Capoeira actually has, among all martial arts, has some of the strongest kicks. Like, along with, like, you know, like, Muay Thai and things like that, where you know the kicking is strong. So, Capoeira does. And I think there was a thing, I don't, I doubt the show even airs now, it doesn't. But there used to be a show, uh, like, Fight Science, and they would break down different martial arts and the kicks. And I remember there was an episode where they were, they were trying to measure the power of like different capoeira kicks. And it was just like seeing it in uh, in a scientific light and honestly like seeing how they're measuring like the pounds per square inch of pressure and but uh but yeah so I it, it is practical. Um I've never I'm trying to think, have I ever had an issue? I've never had a serious issue, thankfully. I've had instances where people have tried to approach me. Or have tried to start something, but it was it's always been one of those things where I once they see my legs go up, they kind of fall back. They're like, Oh, he I think he knows something I don't. So in in high school I had a few instances where I've like I've kicked somebody once and then they may they may have fallen and be like, Okay, I'm just gonna stop. And then yeah. So same thing in high school. I would school, think right, right. now go ahead. I, I would say I I think as well, man, um you know, training in a martial art, man, it kind of gives you this, like, inner confidence, right, that you kind of project outwards, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm just a fan of all martial arts. Like, I think, I mean, I, I respect all styles in martial arts because, in my opinion, truthfully, I don't, I wouldn't say it's one style is better than the other. As long, it's all about the application. Like, if you know how to apply your style in different types of situations, no, no matter what it is, whether it be a one-on-one -on -one situation or whatever, then then you're like that should be everybody's mentality when it comes to training in any martial art. It, if if you enjoy that style, if you're finding some type of freedom in that martial art style, and you're learning how to apply it, then that's that's what it is, really. 
understand that, bro. I definitely understand that, man. Yeah, I, I imagine as well. You know, it's, it's um, you know, your proficiency in it as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Of course. Because if, if someone does capoeira and and they get beat up, and someone's like, "Oh, capoeira sucks." No, it wasn't capoeira it sucks. It was they just didn't know how to use it. <laughs> nah, that's facts, man. That's facts, bro. <laughs> That's facts, man. Tell me, tell me this, but I'm very curious to hear from you, man. You know, growing up in, um, you know, growing up in that that household, uh, I'm very curious to hear from you, man. How important was music in your house growing up? Yeah, so I've always been a fan of movement. Uh, I would say more so my musical influence would probably have come from my brother and my sister, <clears throat> being that they were older they were kind of like a, another set of parents so because there was a big age difference between my siblings and I and then there's an even bigger age difference between like my parents like sometimes as a kid people would think my parents were my grandparents and thought my brother or my sister were my parents um so when it came to like musical influence and everything it wasn't so so much from my parents but just more so my siblings um so I had, I grew up more so with the appreciation of like R and B music and like older hip hop songs and like older reggaeton songs. Like even when I teach dance, I'll touch very much on like the culture of things. Like I'm very big on just culture. Like I love culture. I love just every no matter what culture it is, but really just having an understanding of your culture and who you are and if you're participating in a certain genre or style of music just understanding and knowing where that came from, where that stems from and what influenced it to be what it is and why it sounds the way it does. Uh, so like when I tell, when people, even in college, when people hear my playlist or if I'm in my dorm room and they hear the music, I'm I'm playing, it might be, it might go from like an older reggaeton song to like music soul child and common or like Talib Kweli and then it might jump to like something else and then people were like how how do you know this stuff why do you know this and i was like well my brother and my sister this is what they were listening to and that's who i was around like my favorite my favorite singer is music soul child and that always kind of catches people off guard like i don't i guess they probably expect me to say like i don't know chris brown or something <laughs> that's but my dad listens to that music soul child bro i, I know what you're talking about <laughs> Uh, let me ask you this, man, because um, you know, I, I was informed that you're really big on culture. Um, for for someone who is learning a dance, let's stick to that. Yeah, for someone who's you know learning a dance, why is it important for them to to know the history, to to know the culture, you know, the roots of of that dance? Why is that important? Yeah. So for me, when you're dancing or you're learning any type of movement or style of dance you always want to have a connection to it you always want to have an understanding to it because it's always more than just movement but it's just an expression of your feeling so i just when i'm teaching a class i want people to know what i'm feeling if i so i always tell people in my classes like all right the motivation for this piece is this when i choreographed this piece this is what i was feeling when the song is saying this so this is what i want you to portray but also when we're par- practicing a specific style of movement, that influence and that feeling lives within that style. So especially for someone who's beginning with dance, if you want to understand hip hop and you're like, oh, you know, I'm just starting off hip hop. I know nothing of hip hop. I'm trying to get my movement right. And I think when people are like, <laughs> I guess the best way to put it is the swag when you see people and they're like, they're, they're all there. It's too stiff. It's too much. It's, I think if you understand the history of hip hop and how it was created, I think that swag per se lives within the essence of the history and why it was created. Like, you know, what was going on in the South Bronx, like in the seventies and how it was expression. And, you know, you got your four elements of hip hop and, you know, your MC, your DJ, the graffiti, the, you got your B-boys and, I, there's so much expression and, and feeling within that. So I think if you understand the history and the culture of that genre as a beginner in any style, it will make your learning process much easier and help you find the groove is what we would call it 
in anything. So like I would say that with any style, like if you want to learn a Latin style of movement, like salsa, understand the history of it. So it'll make sense in your mind as you're learning. Okay. Like get, get the feeling, get the essence of it, whether it be capoeira, you know, we always got to learn the history. So, okay. This is, it was created by people who were enslaved in Brazil for a means of freedom against oppression. So I got to be strong. I got to think, even though I'm graceful, I'm combative type of thing. So it's like, even when I'm teaching, I'm very big on teaching reggaeton as well and really pushing the culture forward because I've always, I've been doing this for trying to focus more on reggaeton lately because you see a lot of, a lot of reggaeton classes coming up now. But every time I teach, I'm just very surprised that people don't know the history of it as much. As much as reggaeton is starting to become popular in terms of teaching it, I would just assume that as an instructor, you would take more time in understanding the history of it. And it's, I'm glad that I can break it down to people. Um, but at the same time, I wish it was shared a little more. And I wish I wasn't viewed as like, man, he's one of those few instructors that really knows it. Because I'll, I'll break it. I'll break it down. Like, well, 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 Real quick, man, real quick. I'm going to be honest with you, man. I do not know the history of reggaeton, man. So could you please break it down for me? Yeah, yeah. So, it, so like in the class, um, I was actually teaching a virtual summer intensive to students in New York City. And each week we touch a different style of dance. So reggaeton was one of our weeks. But <clears throat> I think the reason I like doing reggaeton is because it is something of me. Like growing up in an urban environment as a young Latin American, you know, reggaeton is always present. So I feel like if there was one thing I had to look back on, like what's, what's mine? Like what's my culture? That's one of those genres. And a lot of times it's viewed in a negative stereotype, especially by older people, whether it be parents or grandparents, like it's not like it's just dirty dancing or the lyrics just it just always inappropriate. But the cons the history of it, me when I perform it, when I teach it, I don't want to represent any of that. I want to represent the very beginning and why. So Karegaton was really is really a product of the Jamaican diaspora. So of course the word reggae is in there. So in the 70s, when a lot of Jamaicans were migrating to Panama to work on the Panama Canal, now you have this large presence of a Jamaican community in a Latin American country. And essentially what that did was taking the Jamaican culture, the existing reggae culture was then taken and was translated into Spanish. If I wish I would, if we were on the laptop and not on my phone, I would have just played it straight from my phone, some comparison so you could hear the, how similar they are. So originally in Panama, what started was this Spanish style of reggae. And along with any other countries where there's where a lot of countries with people of color, there was racial discrimination. So this style was birthed either out of, out of rebellion, expression, um, and just make their voices heard from the discrimination that was taking place. But it sounded just like reggae music, and it, but it was just in Spanish. So like, if you if you want to look up like El General or something, that you'll you'll you can hear that early sound. And then later on is when Puerto Rico kind of I would say coined the term reggaeton because you have people like DJ Playero or who was considered the first Spanish rapper like Vico C, who started now infusing that this Spanish style of reggae that came from Panama, but now incorporating like Latin rhythms and dance hall and hip hop beats and everything. And then eventually created this style is now known as reggaeton. But reggaeton is always, what you always hear in the element of reggaeton is what's known as the dembo beat. So growing up when people didn't know Spanish, they'd be like, you listen to the same song again? And I'm like, no, it's a different song. <laughs> but you got that underlying beat that yeah. I was about to say, that's it, exactly, yes. Yeah, so the so the dembo rhythm is what you, is what pretty much defines reggaeton in a way, and you see it across everything. And even in other styles and genres of music now that where you can kind of hear that influence, you'll know when they're referencing a, a reggaeton rhythm or, or that dembo rhythm as well um but that's kind of like reggaeton history in 60 seconds i guess but because I, I, was, I was gonna say man it's so when i think of reggaeton i think of that dembow dembow but i think of 
you know, I think of rap, man. I think of like, you know, say somebody spitting over some a beat and not even Spanish reggae, which is so crazy the evolution of that genre. Yeah, so definitely. So that's so that's what I would say is like I would say because of Panama and the Jamaican diaspora influenced reggae and espanol and then which is what influenced and then created reggaeton. And that's where you see a lot more where you see the the other islands of the Caribbean, like specifically Puerto Rico, um, and a lot of artists that have taken the sound and mixed all these other elements together to make what is reggaeton. And even reggaeton in the 90s to now even sounds different. So it's uh so you kind of hear that evolution in the sound. But I would say you hear you hear a lot more if you listen to early uh reggaeton songs from the 90s, whether they be like old old daddy yankee so like even daddy yankee doesn't even sound the same now from what he did then um but yeah yes yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting to hear but that's what i like to represent when i teach or do it and it's it's an influence of of different diasporic styles so i always like to when i'm teaching a class or even in my movement i want i'm good you're gonna see hip-hop in my choreography you're gonna see caribbean movement island movements dancehall movements you're going to see african movements because essentially all of that has influenced our culture as latin americans um and i include that in my reggaeton as well because the sound and the genre was influenced by all these other factors and elements so when i like to do it i'm trying to bring all the roots all the ancestral roots and uh and bring it to light that's what's up, bro. I definitely understand that, man. I, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you, man. Um, so you know, you're growing up in Delaware, man. You're doing Capoeira, man. I'm very curious to hear what happens after you graduate high school. Yeah, so from there, I went off to the University of Delaware. Um, it was always as a kid, because in Wilmington, it wasn't really. You didn't really see that many people go off to college like that. I don't know what the statistic is now, but at that point in time, it was something crazy where like only like one of every 50 youth like go off to like post-secondary education type of thing. So at that point in time, even as a kid, I was always like, you're going to go to college. So even in elementary school, I was like, I'm going to go to college. But I think the emphasis was so much getting to college instead of like, what am I going to do when I get there? So I wish I knew what I knew now about colleges, but I ended up going to the University of Delaware right here. I didn't apply to too many schools. I only applied to like two. Yeah, I applied to University of Delaware and Drexel. And I got accepted into both, but I ended up going to the University of Delaware because I wanted to be close with my parents being older. Um, And then my junior year of high school, my mom actually, as we were prepping for college, there was a job opportunity for her at the University of Delaware. So she interviewed and thankfully through that entire process, uh, she made it and was given the job. So she was like, I'm going to try to work here so that we can get you free tuition type of thing. So, so it was like, if I didn't get a full scholarship anywhere else, the University of Delaware was, but the University of Delaware wasn't like something that was forced on me. I actually liked the campus and wanted to go there. So yeah, I went there. I ended up not knowing exactly what I wanted to study. And as a kid, I was uh, an interesting thing that my that my brother and my parents always laugh about is what I would do at school in the lunchroom because they would pack me lunch and then I would come home and they're like, what did you eat for lunch today? And it would be something completely different. And they're like, so how'd you get all these things when I packed you this? And I was like, well, I sold it. And then I'll go in the lunch line and buy more food than what originally was packed. <laughs> so, and I would do that consistently, like all the time. Somehow I was always able to sell my lunch and go and go into the cafeteria line and buy more food than what I came in with <laughs> to eat. Uh, so my brother was like, oh, you should look into like business or something. So I was like, oh, I don't know what else to study. So that's why I went in business undeclared. And then I had declared finance and I was just like, oh, okay, finance, I want to make money, whatever. So went into that, discovered math and I were not friends as much 
And then, but I started becoming more exposed to culture, um, especially as, after I pledged my fraternity, uh, Lambda Sigma Upsilon Latino Fraternity Incorporated. Um, culture is very big within the fraternity. Um, and then I actually wanted to pursue Latin American studies, but I was already in the business school. So I was like, maybe I'll pursue it as a minor. But then long story short, I was like, as I started figuring things out, I was like, okay, adding these things is going to keep me way longer than I need to be here. I was like, finance is not going to work for me. What's something within the business school that I can relate to and actually have an interest in learning and marketing it was. So I ended up switching my major to marketing and adding a minor in interactive media. And that's how I finished my degree. Um, but that's what it was, my experience in college. I went to UD, got very involved on campus with different student groups, <clears throat> was always very big on the community, especially my fraternity, just trying to represent well and make whatever impact I can on campus, whether it was through student programs, through performances, through shows. And that's, I think the fraternity is what really got me to discover dance because um, my dance mentor or my dance dad is what I call him. Like I always, I always call him like dad. Like people always laugh when, when I'm like, I'm like, thanks dad. <laughs> so he, uh, he's one of my older fraternity brothers and he's based in New York city. His name is Jay Romeo. But if it wasn't for pledging the fraternity, I would have never have crossed paths with him and I wouldn't have been his influence if I would have never made that decision to pledge the fraternity. So he gave me my first dance opportunity in New York City in like 2011. And I would always catch a bus back and forth between Delaware and New York to either assist him on anything. So whether that be, he would put me on a project with him or if I wasn't dancing to assist him. Like if he had to hold an audition for an artist, he would let me be his assistant. So now I'm showing up to the studio and I'm collecting headshots, resumes, recording the auditions and just trying to observe and learn as much as I can. Um, and then through the fraternity, I got to perform more. So I got, we would travel to so many different other campuses to, to be part of stroll competitions. And, and we became good. Like at that point, that's how my chapter, that's how we would make our chapter money. There was one year, I think it was like 2012 or 13. We traveled everywhere we could to compete. And thankfully we won every show we competed in. And that's how we made money as a chapter. We were just like, how are we going to make money for the chapter this year? Fundraise? We we're like, let's just compete. Let's just travel and compete everywhere. And that's what we did. I, I want to ask you this, man. I'm very curious, man. Um, You know, maybe for someone else who is, you know, preparing to go to college themselves. You said earlier, you know, um, if only you knew what you knew now about college. You know, I guess what what do you know about college now that you wish you had known before you went? Yeah, so because of that, when at later on in college, um, before dance became my full-time job, when I graduated, I actually went into work in higher education. So I was, I was an admissions counselor at a small school called Cabrini College, now Cabrini University, just outside of Philly. And before I left, I was an assistant director of undergraduate admissions as well. And even some of my internships right before I graduated were within student affairs and higher education. I was like, before I graduated, before I, I knew and thought dance was going to be a thing, I was, I thought in my head, I was like, I'm going to go into higher education. Like, this is what I want to do. I like the impact being on a college campus can have. And I want to be one of those influential people that can make the meaningful and needed impact for students of color. Um, but so what I learned is, is there's so much out there. Like I was so limited. I never knew the variety of majors. There's so like anything you can think of, even when I'm with students now and I tell them I'm like, well, what do you like? And I'm like, there's a major for it. I was like, it may not be at this university, but it will be at this university. Um, and just understanding the financial aid process and understanding the variety of approaches to take, like even with my oldest niece, she's about to start her freshman year this upcoming fall. And uh, I've been talking to her a lot because she wanted to go straight to the University of Delaware. Um, but because of financial aid, I've been trying to convince her. I was like, you know, do the program where you can do your two years at the community college and then do your last two years, you save money, like just all these different things. And I wish I would have applied to other colleges and other places. I just wasn't as aware or familiar with how big the college and university system is like. 
everything is so different. Do I want to be in a big city? Do I want to be in a small city? Do I want to be on the East Coast? Do I want to be on the West Coast? Do I like a more urban area? Do I want more rural? Do what are the variety of programs like in picking my majors? I only looked at what was offered at the University of Delaware, but who knows? Maybe there was a school in California if I would have looked that had something completely different and would have caught my eye. Um, the variety of schools. So the University of Delaware has like uh, over, uh, I'm probably wrong, but over 18 or 20,000 undergraduate students. But then when I worked at Cabrini, that was a small school that only had 1300 students. So, you know, how would that environment differ? So all, all these different things I try to shed light on when I work with students now, or if they ask me for help in their college making decision, I ask them all these questions. So like, what do you want? What do you want to study? What's the financial aid looking like? What's your financial need? Where, where do you want to go? Do you want to stay home? Do you want to get away from home? Do you want, do you function better in a large classroom? Do you want a large campus where you're going to be in a lecture hall with like 100, 200 other students? Or do you need that smaller attention where there's only going to be 15 students in your class and all these different things? Do you even want to go to college in the U.S.? I was like, do you want to look at college in Europe, in Canada? Or so, so many different things that I ask now that weren't necessarily questions that were made to me as I was younger. And who knows how my experience would have differed. But I also believe everything happens for a reason. So although I didn't have that knowledge then, I think it happened the way it, it needed to happen or supposed yeah. to happen. Okay, I understand that. I definitely understand that. I definitely understand that, man. Uh, I'm curious to hear from you, man. So, so you you finally graduate, correct? Mm -hmm. And so, and so, um, you know, you're tr you're working with your dad, <laughs> your stepdad, your dance, here. your dance dad. I'm curious, man. Um, I guess at what point do you start to take dance seriously and and i guess at what point do you start to or maybe decide you know i would like to do this full time or for the rest of my life yeah so i i remember that exact moment when i made that decision so it was the semester right before i graduated i was interning with the associate what was his title in the admissions office this is so many years ago he was the associate director of it was something along the lines like associate director of uh, diversity and inclusion for undergraduate admission something like that but i interned with him to understand the aspect of of recruitment at a predominantly white institution um, for students of color and there was a one day i called him and i was like i can't come in today because my dance dad we had an opportunity um in new york and i was like hey i can't come in on monday um I have this dance gig, you know, do you mind if I just come back in on Tuesday? And he was like, sure. I was like, that's fine. But I don't think he paid too much mind to it. And I didn't really know exactly. I, I knew the choreography I had to perform, but I didn't really know exactly what we were doing. So we get there and we were on the set um, of It's on Telemundo. It's the morning show, Un Nuevo Dia. And that's like aired now. Like it's that's every morning, like everybody watches it. And I was like, oh, crap. We, we're at the set here. Because I was at the time I was dancing with this artist that was coming up. His name is BB Bronx um, in New York. So we were. So I'm like, we're on national. TV. I was like, we're not even on national TV. We're on international TV. So although I'm not the artist, but I'm in the background. But there's only two dancers. So as the cameras are rolling and seeing the set and like all the people there, like at that, what I felt at that moment in time, it was just like, to me, that felt like like freedom in a way like I wasn't worried about what happened before I wasn't worried about what I was about to do next like I felt like I finally found something where I was able to really enjoy and live in that moment without any concern or worry about anything else like at that moment in time I'm worry free I'm here I'm enjoying it and once I finally felt found and felt that feeling I was like this I want to I want to keep feeling this um, and I would say that for anybody regardless of what it is like whether it's whatever what it doesn't have to be dancing with whatever you do within your career 
when you finally find something where you get that feeling, and it's even like hard to describe. Like, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, if I could just like let, let somebody else feel it, like this is what I felt, I think it would make a lot more sense for people to be like, oh, so that's why. That's why he pursued it. But it was like, once I had that feeling and I was like, I want, I want to keep feeling this again. So then I went back to, to campus and I went to his office and he was like, how'd it go? And I was like, oh, you can pull it up on TV or on, on the computer. So I was like, go to the Telemundo site. And then I helped him find it. And then he watched it and he was like, oh, so you like actually dance dance. He was like, this is like, you were on like TV. And I was like, yeah, if you would have tuned in in the morning, you would have saw me. And he was like, oh, he was like, I thought it was just like some random thing. You were like, I need to dance. So he was like, I was just like, okay, go ahead. He was like, no, nah, you could like, this is like legit. And I was like, yeah. So actually that same year I had applied to Teach for America. So I had to make the tough decision. I had, I had got accepted into the program, which the acceptance rate in Teach for America was very competitive. So I was honored to even be selected to get in and make it through all my interviews. But I knew in my heart, as much as I would have loved it, because I was placed in Chicago, I was supposed to go to Chicago to teach early childhood education. And I had to make a tough decision. It was just like, do I go off and do this? And I'm going to love it because I love the kids. I love the community. I love to teach. I love all that. And I know I'll do great at it. But is it really what I want to do right now? And I was like, no. And the last thing I wanted at that point in time was to go off and do something. And then a few years later or down the line of life is be like, what if? I never want to ask myself, what if? What if I would have done this? What if I would have done that? What if, you know? So I was just like, I can't, I can't wonder that. So I, I withdrew from the program and I just started applying to other jobs to give me time to, I was like, oh, I want to dance. I was like, I want to figure it out. So I kept applying to higher ed jobs. That's when I got my job at Cabrini. I ended up working there for two years. Um, it was just outside of Philly, so I ended up moving from Wilmington to Philadelphia, which wasn't that far at all. So that wasn't a hard transition. But I was always dancing in Philly, connecting with different artists there, starting to do commercial work, connecting with the right people, learning, growing, networking. So it would be office during the day. As soon as I would leave the office, I would go right into Philly, take off my shirt and tie. Now I got on dance clothes, like whatever I was wearing that day. And then eventually in 2016 is when I had the opportunity to audition for Step Africa, which is a professional dance company based in Washington, D.C., dedicated to the art form of stepping. So I was just like, I'm going to go. I was like, here's an opportunity to perform. I got my fraternal background so I can step. And I was like, it's a full time job and they get to tour around the world. So I went for it. And then a few months later, so that audition was in May of 2016. A few months later, I got the phone call, like in, I want to say like late July. And they were like, yep, this is, this is C. Brian Williams, the founder and executive director of Step Africa. I was like, oh yeah, I remember. And he was like, you know, calling to offer you a position on a spot on the cast. And you know, ultimately I accepted it, put in my two weeks at Cabrini. <laughs> And then ever since 2016, dance has been on a full-time job. Uh, that sounds amazing, man. I, I'm very, I'm very extremely curious to hear from you, man. Um, you know, you live a different, like since 2016, man, you live a very different lifestyle than others, man, you know, who have to maybe clock in nine to five. I'm not saying that you don't, man, but I'm very curious to hear from you, man. You know, what are some things that people may not know about the life of a full-time dancer? Uh, I just, in terms of full-time dancer, me, I think because dance came so so late in my life, like my approach to dance in my dance career is very different. Even with other dancers here in Delaware, now that I'm back in the city, um, and the dancers coming up in this area, I always tell them, because there's a lot of talented dancers, but I always tell people, I'd always tell people my goal I don't just want to be another IG dancer. I don't just want to be this. I was like, I was like, if this is what y'all really want to do, like you need to monetize it. Like, how do you want to, how are you going to brand yourself? Like, what's the, what's the long-term goal? Like, how are you going to build longevity with this thing? And I was like, don't just 
build this popularity and do nothing with it. And then you reach a certain point in life where you can't move a certain way or you no longer look a certain way. And then what? Then you didn't build anything else with with the dancing. Um, so that's that's my approach. And that's why it's very different. Um, but that's what I always encourage any anybody, whether it be dance or not, if you're going to do something and live this entrepreneur life or this self-employed life, like just always think of longevity. Like what's because that's that's ultimately what led to me leaving Step Africa as much as it was probably one of the hardest decisions for me. So I toured from 2016 to 19 and it was I loved it. I was like, I'm. I find, I'm finally in a place where I get to wake up every day and dance and I get to tour around the country and around the world. So I was like, why am I leaving this? But I left because I just knew I wanted to build more. And I knew that I loved performing so much that I wanted to do more for, I want because eventually I do want to have a family and I want to be able to support a wife and kids, but I want to be able to support them with what I love. And I love that experience so much. And I'm so thankful for how I was able to grow and everything they were able to teach me. But financially as well, it's, I, it's, I'll always tell people, if you're, if you just got to take care of yourself, if you're a bachelor, it's, it's great bachelor money. But I just kept thinking, I need to build family money. So I kept thinking. So if I was the type of person that I was like, you know, I don't, I don't never plan on getting kids, you know, or having kids or nothing like that. Cause there's a lot of people in the dance world like that as well. And that's completely fine. And by all means, I would have stayed. I was like, I'm just, boom, I'm here for me. But um, I knew what the end goal was. And then at the same time, it was a lot of touring. So I wanted to come back home and be around my family. I felt like I missed like a lot of family moments. But <clears throat> I always tell people just, you just got to be persistent. You got to be resilient and you got to stick through it. That first year of touring, I loved it. But it was such an adjustment from leaving a job where I was already making good money. My first year, I did take a pay cut. And it, and then I moved to an even more expensive city. And that, but it was just that one, that first year was the rough year, that transition year, because I had to figure out a lot of things. And then, you know, you get a, you get a pay increase the longer you're in the company. So once we got to season two and three, the circumstances were different. But that first year of just moving and adjusting I'm not going to lie, I doubted myself a lot, and I almost gave it up. I was just like, I don't know if this is for me right now. but And I'm glad I didn't give it up. Um, but you always just tell people, if you're dancing and this is what you want to do, it's not, it's not going to be easy, of course. You're going to have these obstacles. But you got to believe in yourself more than anybody else. Like you, I always ask people, like, what's your vision and what do you want? Because And the reason I ask that is because if you understand what you want and you understand what the vision is, now you got to believe that more than anybody else because nobody else is going to understand it. Nobody else is going to see the vision the way you see it. But if you yourself know what your vision is, believe that thing. Like more, more than anybody, when people try to tell you, because people try to tell me that, okay, so you're going to dance. That's going to be your job. Like what's your... So what's going to be your real job? And then now, because of what I've been able to accomplish over the years and the opportunities that I've gotten, now people are like, no, I don't get those questions anymore. Because they're like, oh, snap. That is Manny's real job. Look at everything. Manny said he was going to do this, and he actually went out and did it. So, yeah, it's like, just don't be afraid to put yourself out there. But try to be, I was going to say strategic, but sometimes you don't, you got to learn along the way. Just be intentional. Be intentional. Have, have purpose behind it. What do you want to do? Have purpose. And for me, I love dance so much. But what I love more about it is that I always grew up wanting to make an impact on communities. That's why I went into higher ed. And dance just became, not only did I get to do something that I enjoyed, but dance became something that allowed me to connect with so many people around the world. And I probably wouldn't have had that same impact if I would have gone anywhere else. So for me, my passion and my purpose was how can I help and impact others in a positive way? As a kid, you growing up with all these stereotypes and you see people view you in a certain way. Like I walk into a room and people would question my intelligence or my ability based on what I look like or what neighborhood I came from. 
but dance gave me a platform and an opportunity to, to flip that, to switch that, to come across so many other people everywhere and have an impact on them. So I got to do what I love, got to enjoy it, and I got to make, and I continue to make impacts like I want to. So that's what I just tell all these dancers. There's so many different ways to, to do this thing within the arts. Just, it's not all about IG and being TikTok famous and all that. Like, and that's what I used to think. I used to think the only way to make it as a dancer was through this commercial world. And then, you know, I got the opportunity to go with Step Africa and, and go everywhere, anywhere in theaters and, and through arts education and just seeing there's so many avenues to, and different lanes within dance. So. I understand. I definitely understand that, bro. I, let me ask you this. Um, you know, you've been dancing for, you know, quite a long time now, man. And, you know, you've been a full-time dancer since 2016, man. I'm very curious to hear from you, man. What are some lessons that you have learned from dancing that you're able to translate to your everyday life? Yeah, for me, probably the biggest thing that I've gone from dancing that I translate to my everyday life is definitely just like resilience and persistence. Um, as cliche as that probably sounds, it's just when you do, when you make the decision, when you make the conscious decision to pursue a, a non-traditional lifestyle or career, there's going to be a lot of things that go along with it. Um, so of course I had to be persistent and resilient because like I said, it's not it's not your traditional career. A lot of times people treat dance as a hobby and it's not a hobby for me. Like it's it's my livelihood. It's how I make my money. It's how I pay my bills. It's how it's how I survive. Um, so I guess because of the things I've had to overcome and the obstacles and things I've had to learn because of this pursuit of a non-traditional career, I don't. And on an everyday basis is, I wouldn't say I shy away from challenges as much as probably others would or get as, in, I don't get intimidated easily by things. So I was like, look, I've had to deal with so many other things and have had to overcome and figure things out like on the spot type of thing, doing this non-traditional career path um, that now I kind of just wake up and I don't ever, I don't ever fear that I'm not going to have it. Like, I don't ever fear, like, oh, I'm going to be broke. I'm not going to have a home. I'm not going to have food. My mentality has become, I'm going to always figure it out. So I'm never like, oh, oh my gosh, what's, what's, I don't have this right now. I don't have this. I don't have that. Oh, what's going on? I don't have it. Like, uh, I'm freaking out. It's like, you know what? Let me take a step back, look at everything. Boom, let's figure it out. That's amazing, bro. That's a great mindset. Um, to be able to be your know, calm through the storm. That's a, that's a great mindset. You need well, I'm I mean, I'm big on my faith though, too. So like I'm you know, I'm I'm very, very big on my faith, but no, I agree. But I think when you're I just, I'm just very thankful and I feel like over the years I've gotten to a point where I have a sense of security in myself and I have a sense of understanding in my faith and like my, and like my relationship and my belief in God that I think when you just kind of reach a certain state of like comfort and self-awareness and like self-respect and just a certain level of consciousness and understanding, it's like, I don't need to worry about what other people think, what's going on. Like, like I would be good. Worry about the things you can't control, the things you can't control. You can't dwell on them. You got to keep them moving. And I just think all of that applies. I think all these mental things and perspective and understanding applies to everything, really. So, of course, I apply it to dance because that's what I love to do. But I think given whatever career path I would have taken or whatever it is, like, you know, as long as you keep a sound mind, strong belief and faith and persistence and resilience and 
you know, let people say what they let people say what they say. I mean, if you're still doing it, that's it. I don't want it to come off as sounding rude, but when I used to take classes with some of my former castmates, you know, nowadays these kids they're like 12 and they're like these super Power Ranger dancers, and I'm like, how are y'all so young and like so good? But we were going to these classes and they're like. They're like, man, are you not nervous? These kids are gonna eat us up. And I'm like, no, I'm not nervous. They're like, why not? And I would tell them, I'm like, well, one, it's class. So you're allowed to mess up because that's what class is for. I was like, it's not a performance or an audition. I was like, if it was, you know, it would be different. But I, if I want to mess up, class is my space to experiment, mess up, try things. And um, and I was like, and two, I'm booked. I was like, I was like, none of these, I was like, are any of these other kids booked? I was like, they can look at me all types of sideways and crazy as they want. And I was like, but at the end of the day, I'm going to leave this class. I'm going to go home. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to wake up. And I wake up to a job where we're probably going to fly out somewhere and get to perform. And just so I, they would just start laughing. And I'm like, look, we don't need to come in here and be intimidated by anything. I was like, at the end of the day, I'm booked. And that's just me saying, like, I understand what I have. So why do I need to compare myself to anybody else when they're trying to get to a position that I'm in? I understand that, bro. I definitely understand that. that's a great way to put it, man. <laughs> um, I wanna I want to give some value to, you know, to maybe some listeners out there, people who may be listening, man. So let me let me ask you this, man. Um and I know you're a choreographer, so I'm very curious to hear from you, man. Um, I guess how do you, how do you maintain? How do you spark your creativity? How do you know when you're doing a choreography? Man, how does that something? How do you how do you improve it? How do you maintain it? How do you keep it flowing and not hit that, you know, that creativity block? Yeah, that's um, that was a big thing for me, especially now with the pandemic. Um, it's because, I mean, the pandemic clearly hit a lot of people in different things, and then especially within the arts. So a lot of my dance friends, it was very easy early on to be like frustrated because we have all these things lined up and ready to go, and then now everything is just taken away. Like, uh, so for me, the creative block or to overcome a creative block is just, I just got to push myself. I just try to think of new things. I, I watch things. If I need to find inspiration, I just go outside and just look around, just drive around the city. Do I see a mural that might inspire me? Do I see a person that looks a certain way and you know makes me think, oh, I like their look, let me try this. Or sometimes I even go on YouTube and just watch different dancers, choreographers, just random class videos. and. Or I'll look up a song that I like and I'll be like, such and such song, choreography, and then just see what pops up and then just see how different people interpret and choreograph in different ways. Um, so I just try to, when I get in that creative block, I try to draw inspiration from, from other things that are around me, whether it be music that I like, um, whether it be what's around me right now, or just seeing other people's creative process and kind of like something in me to go, oh, I like how they did this. You know what, I can, if I have this piece, let me try to elevate it a little bit. So for me, I'm inspired by just what's around me and especially by other artists and other, like I, I like seeing other people create. I like seeing other people go through that process. I like seeing other people's classes or if I can't be there in person watching it because I get to learn and I get to be inspired in a way because everybody's creative process is different. So that's how, that's, that's, how I would, that's how I draw it. And then during the pandemic, I actually started participating in a dance competition on Instagram. So it was like bracket style with this guy that I know he went to UD and he started his own media company called Grand Tour Media here in Delaware. And he, I guess he wanted to start a dance contest, like almost like March Madness, but with the bracket style. So we're actually in the final round of it now. So it started with 17, it was 16, started with 17 dancers because they had one like battle where somebody got the last slot. 
Um, and then it was just like he would post the videos um, like today's battle is such and such and such and such and um, vote on the Instagram story for you got 24 hours to vote. So the person with the most votes will move on. So, yeah, so I, I participated in that. I was like, let me participate in this to one support, but two, I need to create. And I was like, maybe the competitive, the competitive nature of it will get more out of me. And I'm glad I did because it because it did. I don't I think if I didn't participate in something like that during this time, maybe I wouldn't have been as motivated or pushed to create in the way that I created. Like the first round, we had to create uh it could do whatever. The second round we had to incorporate a prop. The third round we had to do uh use a partner. And then now this round, so I thankfully out of I made it to the final round. So it's just two dances left, myself and another. And we had to um, use the same song. So when he posts the video, it's just people are going to just base, vote based on what they think is the best video and choreography, but it's the same song. So trying to find ways to put myself in something. I would say to get past that creative block for anybody, is just don't stay stagnant. If you feel like you got a creative block, don't stay still. Find something to inspire you. Find something to push you. Like I said, for me, it was participating in a, in a competition, that competitive nature, because I am a competitive person. Like, it's all love, and, you know, I'm never going to be a sore loser, but if I'm part, I'm in it to win it every time. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. Connect four, dance competition, uno, I'm in it to win it. That's, that's awesome, bro. I understand that, man. I definitely understand that. Uh, let me ask you this, bro. When I say the word musicality, what does that mean to you? Oh, I love I love that word musicality. So, to me, it's it's how how you listen to the music and through movement. How do you how does your body move to the music? Because essentially, as a dancer, we give life to the music. Like when you hear when you listen to a song, you're listening to it. And then what you're listening to may make you feel a certain way. But now as a dancer, I get to be the physical form of that sound. So what are the different things that you're hearing within that song and that music? And how are you going to translate it through your body? Like, are you moving to the lyrics? Are you moving to the beat? What are you bringing to life? And just what are you listening to? And how detailed are you going to be within your music? within your movement as you listen to the music or what will the audience see? So to me, that that's, that's musicality. So when I see people and they're like, when I see them hit like even the slightest beat and the way their body is like, Ooh, I'm like, that's so crazy. That was so hard, but they hit that. I am just like, Oh, that musicality was crazy. They're like, they're giving you everything, but that's what it is to me is how, how are you listening to music and what's your interpretation? of being that physical form of the audio. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I definitely understand that, man. Let me ask you the follow-up to that question then, man. How does one improve their musicality? Yeah, just just keep training. Um, listen to music. Uh, to improve musicality, it doesn't always have to be constantly dancing but take moments where you just listen to music try to find different things within the music that you probably wouldn't have like take one if you have a song that you like take one time and just listen to the words listen to it again and try to not listen to the words but listen to the beat listen to everything behind it and then just try to find those little things and then if you want try to start creating to it and find those different things. If you're somebody that typically choreographs to the lyrics of the song, challenge yourself and, and choreograph to the beat where you're hitting all those. You just, whatever you hear, the, the bass, the hi-hats, whatever it is, try to challenge yourself in that form. Um, yeah, there's so many, there's so many things when, as a dancer, even for myself, I, when we operate in counts, like whether it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now try to challenge yourself where you're using half counts or quarter counts where you're hitting up one and two and three. So if your movement is usually one, 
to real basic. Now try to push yourself a little more and go and one and two and three and four and five six eighty and a one two. So try to try to in, incorporate these other things and push yourself a little more where instead of just riding at one, two, three, four, try to use those half counts and quarter counts that are in between um, in the sound and in the music. And go for it. Don't be don't be afraid to experiment. But it's it's so it's so interesting because within dance, I feel like I've learned a lot more of about music because of dance. Like I don't have a musical background, but like I never would have thought I could have a conversation with someone and and break down, you know, measures of sound through like, oh, this is a eight count, this is a half count, this is a quarter count. This you know, like <laughs> I understand that. I definitely understand that. And being able to, um, you know, I guess understand the the concept of music, you know, the rhythm, the the repetition, repeti- repeti- repetitive manner of it, you know, just understanding music, it, it really helps with the music guy. So I understand that, bro. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I want to ask you one more question. Last question I want to ask you, bro. Uh, can you give me one tip that can make anyone a better dancer immediately all right i gotta make sure this one's good all right one tip that will make okay i got it because i want to make it more than just the movement so of course of course you know practice makes perfect of course you want to continue training from a mental perspective, for anybody who is a dancer and anybody, whether you've been in the game for a while or whether you're younger or older and you're just starting out, it's just uh, don't compare yourself. Just be you. Because we were talking about it yesterday in, in the workshop with the kids in the summer intensive, how we were talking about how comparison is the thief of joy. So... And that's very easy to do when you're a dancer or trying to dance. You look at who's in the studio and you compare yourself. You look at who are the Instagram, YouTube dancers, and you're like, I need to look like them. If you're walking into a setting to learn and teach, stop comparing yourself as to what you don't look like. Recognize what you do look like, what you have now, and build on that. Um, And that has helped me a lot. So that's what I would say, other than that comparison, is the thief of joy. So if you're constantly worried about comparing yourself to what the next person is doing next to you, you're never gonna fully recognize and acknowledge your own growth and your own process within that. So and just be you, be 100% you genuinely, and it's okay if your movement doesn't look like anybody else. Be great in what you do, and somebody will value it. And pay you for it if that's what you want. <laughs> That's amazing, man. It's super, super true, man. You know, the comparison, Thief of Joy. That's so true, man. And I, I, I'm, I really appreciate you saying that, bro. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, bro. I, I want to, yeah, at this point, man, I really want to thank you, uh, man, you know, for taking time out to talk to you, man. I really appreciate that, bro. Nah, I, pre- I appreciate you reaching out and, uh, and uh, yeah, doing yeah, this for real. So when you, when you sent the message with the invitation, I was just like, like, why not? I mean, we, we've never met each other or anything like that, but I was just like, you know, if somebody reaches out, I was like, you know, has an interest in what I'm doing. I want to, I want to support as well. So that's, that's, that's another, that's another thing while it's still recording. I want people to realize is that's another tip as a dancer or anything, you know, everything doesn't always have to be with the biggest things. Like, support each other if you're an upcoming dancer or if you have a following you know support other people still like whether you are like when you sent when you sent me the when you sent me the message as like like asking for the interview or anything like before i saw what the page was about and i was like i'm gonna say yeah i was like whether it was a big following or a small following it's all got to start at some point so regardless and what any of us do in our career, what I do, regardless of how big I get or how big my following will grow, 
Like I'm always try to do my best to support people in their own endeavors. And if I have something to offer that can bring value or support that, I'm going to do it because I would love for people to do the same for me as well. So if I want people to do that for me, I need to be willing to do that for other people as well and support them in their own journeys and what they're trying to do as well and within their own purpose. That's amazing, bro. And I really appreciate it, man. Seriously, thank you so much, man. Tell me, uh, tell me this real quick, man. Um, you know, times are pretty crazy right now, but tell me, man, um, do you have any upcoming events, anything you want to plug, anything you want to share with the people? Yeah, so before COVID, <laughs> we had a lot planned. Um, since I've left, since I stopped touring with Step Africa, I left to start building my own company called La Cultura Dance Collective where we really focus on representing culture through rhythm and movement. And uh, so we've taken how I was breaking out reggaeton earlier and really representing reggaeton and the different influences of it. So we do many different styles of dance. We had a lot coming up that we would have been doing right now. A lot of workshops, things that we were supposed to be flying out to. And we had audition for this big opportunity that was supposed to take us international. Hopefully that doesn't get canceled and when things clear up, we can go. So I can't say too many details on it yet just because of disclosure issues, but we did audition for for a show that would have been seen. Um, and we made it past the auditions, but then COVID hit and everything got put on pause. So I hope that that's not it. But right now we got other things coming up that we're trying to work in. We're working on really establishing ourselves as an entity, as La Cultura. So if anybody listening or watching wants to support what I'm doing, it's just follow my page, uh, which is on Instagram or my site. You can go to either my Instagram is just one swift motion and then manychacon.com as well as La Cultura, La Cultura Dance is the Instagram page. Um, but everything there is just supporting what we're doing. We're, we're trying to navigate this whole virtual world and how things are going as, as a group and as a collective and getting back to teaching and not slowing down that momentum that we had um, right before the pandemic hit. Um, so yeah, we have some programs coming up, partnering with some nonprofits throughout New York, uh, in New York City. Um, we are partnering here in Delaware. I actually just got off the phone conversation, partnering with the Delaware Art Museum to bring some programming for the community where we get to talk about the culture, have some workshops, have some performances. Um, and now just we're working. So if anybody out there is interested, wants to support the cause, the movement, loves what I'm talking about, loves what La Cultura represents, think we can bring something of value for you, your organization, your group, give us a follow and you can reach out to us and we can even continue on a separate conversation from there. But I do have that competition coming up. So if you see it round four, I'm gonna need your votes. So follow my page so you can vote. <laughs> Hey, hey, definitely, man, definitely, bro. Um, Emmanuel, man, I, like I said earlier, man, I'll say it again. You know, man, I want to thank you so much, man, for taking time to share your talks, man. I really appreciate that, bro. Hey, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you having me. Of course, of course, man. Um, and I guess let me ask you this, man: Is there anything you want to share with the people before we wrap up this episode of the Two Lift Feet Podcast? Any last words you want to share? Uh, last words is I hope everybody is staying healthy everybody's doing well during these crazy times if the pandemic has hit you hard you know hang in there we'll all get through this we'll all make it through just know this is something that was outside of our control but we're all dealing with it so you're never alone in this whole thing so i hope everybody's doing well hang in there stay stay positive stay healthy keep your hands clean don't let nobody touch you <laughs> and we'll We'll make it through it, but you know, just believe in yourself more than anybody else. That's the important thing. Believe, believe in you. You gotta believe in you before more than anybody else will. And as long as you got that belief in yourself and you wake up with a positive mindset that's motivated, you got this. Hey, I think that is a perfect way to end this episode of the Two Lefty Podcast. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, take it easy, brother. Thank you, you too. Hey.
That's all it is. Hey everyone, uh, if you made it this far to all the end of the video, I want to thank you so much. Um, my overall goal with making these interviews and these episodes is uh, to give a voice to dancers, you know, to give them a platform to speak their story. So uh, if this is of value to anyone, then that, that means the world to me. Um, my overall goal is to give value to the dance community. So, if you find no value in this, then I, I urge you to please let me know where I can improve on. Um, I, I truly want to, you know, just uh, give value and content to, to the dance community. Um, so, please let me know how I can improve, where I'm messing up, because to be 100% honest with you, I'm, you know, I'm learning along the way as I do this. I, I truly am. So um, to be able to interact with you know the dance community, it means the world to me because it it gives me feedback and it lets me know you know what I'm doing right, where I can improve upon, um, you know what I'm doing wrong, which I feel like might maybe more important. Um, so please, if you all could could comment and just let me know what you think, it, it means the world to me because you know that feedback just helps me improve. So. Um, Please comment uh, as well, you know, please like and subscribe. That means a lot as well. Um, but, you know, I, I want to say thank you so much for for just watching this because it means the world to me. Um, you know, I want to I wanna take you on this journey of the Two Love Feet podcast. You know, I'm, I'm very excited for it. So once again, thank you so much.